Now it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker. I'd like to thank Joe Schaefer for joining us today. Joe is the founder and president of F32 Partners, which is an executive coaching, leadership, development, training, and human resources strategy consultancy. He also serves as an executive coach for the Rutgers Business School Executive MBA program and is an instructor at Joint Base McGuire Dix Lakehurst's Hiring Our Heroes program. Previously, Joe was the Associate Dean of Executive Education at Rutgers Business School, at which time he was also my awesome boss. Prior to joining Rutgers, Joe was the Vice President of Human Resources for the Americas, Middle East, Africa, and Asia for TNT. Joe, uh, TNT, was, um, which is now a subsidiary of FedEx, sorry, that's uh, relevant information. Joe earned his master's degree in human resource management from Rutgers University and holds a postgraduate award in business and management from Warwick Business School in the UK. He earned his executive coaching certificate from Columbia Business School. Joe, now that I've told them how well qualified you are to talk about coaching, I'm gonna let you take it from here. Okay, Max, thank you very much. Thank you for those kind words. Um, welcome everybody into my den. I wish I could be in front of you and see you and um, have you around me, which would be much more natural uh, for most of us at this time. But hey, we'll figure this out as we go. Um, I hope this seminar finds many of you well. Uh, boy, there's lots going on in the world around us. I know many of you are probably rethinking Thanksgiving Day um, preparations and where that's actually going to take place. I know my family is. And on that note, um, I was told that since I can't see anybody, I should have a picture of someone so I can at least see them. And of course, I didn't prepare. So just you saw me get up early if you came in early. This is a, a picture my granddaughter made of a mermaid. So I think I'm going to put her face right behind the camera so I can imagine uh, the mermaid and Addison throughout this whole process. Uh, again, Margaret, thank you. It is a, a lunch. I hope you'll learn something. We won't go the full hour, I can assure you. There's, you have a lot going on. You're hearing about 16,000 words a day as it is, about 125 words a minute. So I will keep that number to a minimum as long as we do at the same time ensure understanding. I want to take this time also to thank the Rutgers Business School, Rutgers Exec Ed, Dean Lay, for allowing me to be wherever you are today, in your den, in your kitchen, some of you at the office, and perhaps other places as well. Just what you want to hear, I'm going to start today's hour reading from a book. Yes, it will be short, I promise you. It's a, from a really amazing book called Emotional Agility by Susan David. And this is an introduction she uses to introduce emotional agility. Quite frankly, I think it's a better introduction to coaching. Let me read just for a couple of minutes for you. So you have to imagine now you're on the deck of this Downton Abbey era dreadnought class battleship. And you're standing next to the captain on this deck. And he's well regarded. He's what you're watching the sun set across the sea. And the captain's about to go down to rest. And suddenly the lookout announces lights are dead ahead, about two miles. The captain turns back towards the helm and says, Is it steady or moving? There was no radar back then, by the way. Remind me to tell you about the question about how I almost backed into my wife's car because I didn't have the backup camera. Um, steady, Captain. Um, it's not moving. Then signal that ship, the captain ordered gruffly. Tell them you're on a collision course. Alter your course 20 degrees. The answer came from the source of light. In a moment, the answer was advisable. You change your course 20 degrees. The captain was insulted. Not only was his authority being challenged, but it was being done in front of a junior seaman. Send another message, he snarled. We are the HMS Defiant. I wish I could do a British accent, but I wouldn't even try. 
a 30,000 ton battleship of the dreadnought class, change course 20 degrees. Brilliant, sir, came the reply. I'm Seaman O'Reilly, second class. Change your course immediately. Apoplectic and red in the face, the captain shouted, we are the flagship of Admiral Sir William Atkins Wills. Change your course 20 degrees. There was a moment of silence before Seaman O'Reilly replied, we're a lighthouse, sir. So a little bit of a problem there, as you can see, and perhaps this captain could also use some training. And the book goes on to talk about, we only wish we had an ability to have this um, sense to see what's ahead of us. The captain assumed through all of his years of experience, this is a ship. He never imagined it was a lighthouse. And this is something that is referred to by a famous economist, Torsten Velbin, called trained in capacity. Once you become so experienced and so familiar with something, you automatically forget about the context and come to prefabricated conclusions. I'm experienced, I've been here before, I know what I'm talking about. And the research shows, believe it or not, as we get older, that's something we all need to be very cognizant of. We're experienced, we've been there before, we make quicker decisions. And I hope that you know, when we think about at any age, how a coach can help. And I like to think about coaching in a different way in terms of how this captain saw the lighthouse. And I think it's a perfect segue into coaching. The, you know, the, the lighthouse gave him a direction. It didn't tell him exactly what might be in the way. A lighthouse as a coach can serve as a beacon to where you want to go, whether it be a short-term goal, medium-term goal, long-term goal, and saying, this is a good direction to go in. I won't take you there. I'll help you get there. And that's what I call destinations illuminated. As a, as a leader, and you can use some of these coaching concepts, principles, in my mind, to make you a better leader. The goal of this session is not to make you all executive coaches. The goal is to introduce some concepts associated with executive coaching that may improve your leadership abilities. It may improve the way you manage, the way you lead. So let's get right into it by showing you this crazy mug. But before we get into that, let me tell you about my backup story camera. Boy, you know, just like the captain, he made assumptions about his experience. He became used to having a lookout. Please be careful if you get in a car now that doesn't have that backup camera or the beeps. I got in my car the other day, one that doesn't have a backup camera. As I proceed to back up, I looked down at the radio. There was no, no screen there. Tell me was behind me. I quickly realized that's okay. I'll hear the beeps when I get close. There were no beeps either. So why am I telling you the story? I don't know. Don't make the same mistake I made. Let's go back to this guy's face. When I look at his face, maybe I should keep his face in front of me. This is my coach. This was my coach at Rutgers back in the early 1970s. His name is Francis X. Gagliano. And I really can smile when I look at him. I, 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 I think back. And when I think about capturing the essence of what a coach could be and should be, he's the guy. He's the guy who was born and raised in the Bronx, was a football player, went down to the University of Richmond to play football as quarterback, and came back to New Jersey to coach a football team at Roselle Catholic. By the way, I don't know if Bill Downey is out there, but we also have another alum of Roselle Catholic, a Rutgers alum and a Roselle Catholic alum, Bill Downey. Hello, Bill, if you're listening. And Coach Gags came back to coach football. Well, Roselle Catholic never developed a football team. So he had to learn how to coach something else. And he coached track and field. And he figured, I can throw the javelin. That's close enough. I'll figure the rest out. And the story about why am I talking about Coach Gags is here's a guy who knew nothing about 
running or track and field. And over the course of his career at Rutgers, Georgetown, Oregon Track Club, Nike Track Club, he produced 140 All-Americans and three Olympians. So it wasn't his knowledge, it wasn't his expert knowledge that developed these amazing athletes. He had this unique ability to be that beacon, that lighthouse, that shining light, and had an ability to inspire and motivate you to be your best. I think of him often, and I thought, geez, I wonder what he's doing today. Well, this is what he's doing today. He's still coaching 59 years later. And yes, I spoke to him yesterday to talk to him about what I was going to present. And I asked him the question, what makes a great coach? And it was simple. He said, it starts with the person and the family. He said, not just the person you're coaching, but the influences and everything going around, on around that person you're coaching is most important. Number two, and he was a Rutgers coach, Georgetown coach. He said, then of course, you have to think about academics. Third, you're thinking about their performance on the athletic field in that order. And that told me something about, hmm, no wonder why I admire this man so much. Not only did he produce amazing athletes, he produced amazing individuals over the years with this whole notion of care about people, help them reach their potentials, help them reach their goals, and some good things will follow after that. And sure enough, when I was ending the conversation, I said, you know, I chose you over Coach Wooden, who was also a pretty good basketball coach at UCLA over those years. And he reminded me that he's been coaching for 60 years. And finally, he's coached more athletes than John Wooden. Closer to home, we also recognize, many of you will recognize this story with Coach Ciano speaking with Eric Legrand, who was tragically injured on the football field 10 years ago now. And when you look at that relationship, you recognize whether we like it or not, that there is this amazing power, a bond that's built between coach and coachee. One that is much different than many of the relationships we have with our leaders and managers. I'm not suggesting we change all that, but I'm suggesting perhaps if you take some, adopt some of the methodologies that Coach Shiano used, Coach Gaglana used, to inspire people to develop a relationship that goes a lifetime, a lifetime of deep relationships. And this is what Eric Legrand said about Coach Ciano just last year. I'll let you read that. I mean, it's about really caring about individuals. It's about a relationship. It's about getting people to the next level. So let's leave the coaching athletic field and talk about this Lunch and Learns framework today. We'll start with a working definition of coaching. And yes, you'll see references both to perhaps the battlefield in some cases, uh, the boardroom and athletic field, but I am very cognizant of the fact that it's too easy to just build this simplistic relationship between how coaching and leading is similar in all of those venues. They're much different in some ways, but we will be sure to look at, hey, no matter what the venue, what does coaching mean? And most importantly, for the purposes of this discussion, how can some of those uh, methodologies, tactics help you become a better leader? We'll talk about some reasons why it's good to lead like a coach. I promised in the introduction before applicable coaching concepts that you can put into action immediately. So this won't be highly theoretical. Hopefully after you leave this session, you'll have some ideas around, maybe I can modify, change, introduce some new ways of how I lead. And I want you to think about coaching and at the end, rather than a Q&A, uh, I'd be most interested in hearing your comments, your ideas, 
your great um, coaching stories. And so we can share it with the entire group as opposed to just a normal question and answer session, which I'm happy to do as well. So let's look at some of these definitions around coaching. The first one comes from the Graduate School Alliance of Executive Coaching Programs. And notice a few key words here. Um, it's a development process. It's another way of developing people that work for you, that, ha, that maybe you work for, that maybe you work side by side with. And it builds a capability to achieve organizational goals. So from that perspective as an executive, if the people that work with me and for me are, are, are exceeding their own goals, it's likely as a leader, I'll exceed mine. And hopefully that will translate into greater levels of organizational effectiveness. Another one comes from the ICF International Coaching Federation. And take a look at some key words here, partnering. In, in most of my sessions with my clients, I start by saying, I'm gonna be your thought partner. And that's one distinction between other methodologies often associated or confused with coaching, like mentoring, consulting, and counseling. But in this case, it's a true partnership. Hopefully it's thought provoking and hopefully it's both inspiring and creative. But the goal is maximize potential again. No change there. Another one from um, these authors, Kimsey House, there's two Kimsey Houses here. Um, and that, I like this definition too, because it talks about awareness, which we will talk about in a few moments. It also talks about empowerment and also talks about decisions. So that's what coaching is about. It's about inspiring. It's thinking about different directions we can go in, in terms of getting to a goal that we set, no matter what beacon that is, what lighthouse we're going towards. This is what we need to think about. And then finally, when it comes down to the bottom line, it really is, what are we doing to unlock the person's potential that works for me, works side by side? And a lot of these, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of these concepts work very well with both your boss and your peers. So think about developing performance potential around you, regardless of your situation. And now you're thinking, okay, great. It's lunch and learn. Joe, have you seen what's going on around this? Is this a, a, the, the right time when my organization's probably stressed in terms of resources time and you are suggesting I introduce this soft and fuzzy approach to leadership at a time when doing more with less, we're moving very quickly and is now the time to start given this thing, it's like an alien from another world, isn't it? That has changed our lives in so many ways, both personally, professionally. It has changed the way many of us think about life in general. It's surely changing the way our mind is racing around uncertainty, anxiety, angst, whatever it may be. But that little thing right there truly has changed so much around what's happening around us. Many of you might be doing this right now. I've seen some hilarious videos of what it's like to be working from home these days. And so you're, you have this uncertainty, you have this environment like never before, and you're saying maybe this isn't the time. And with this going on and this going on, you certainly have that going on. And what is that? Well, that's the human brain, but there's a section highlighted there. And that highlighted section is the prefrontal cortex of your brain. And boy, is that thing lighting up right now. It's lighting up because when there's not sufficient information to easily synthesize. There's, there's a lot of uncertainty. 
that part of the brain begins to generate a lot of ideas around, what well, if this happens, what well, if this happens, it gives us a, it tries to make a, gives us a sense of control when we know there is no control. And it often falls us into the fact that as we go through these different scenarios, we are problem solving. So my argument to you today from my den in lovely downtown Bridgewater is now's the perfect time to think about this. So let's get started. I can't help but being part of a great institution like Rutgers to look at some of the research. This is research by the name, a guy from uh, Australia, Sydney, Australia, um, Grant, and talks about the coaching process actually is very effective during times when change is happening. His research was all around change. And let's face it, this COVID situation is fostering, uh, um, prompting so much change in our lives in many ways. This really is a, a solution-based way of thinking, um, one we need more than ever during times of change. So there's one argument there. Some more arguments. It focuses on the whole person. And boy, if there's not a time as a business leader that you need to focus on your employees as a whole. I mean, I can't think of one since I've been working, right? perhaps 9-11 and some other cases, where so much is swirling around the individuals we work with every day, we see every day. And when you look at the whole person, you really can drive new levels of engagement, which we'll talk about a little bit, innovation and creativity. It also gives you a framework for launching a conversation. And we'll talk about precisely what coaching is. I mean, coaching is, when you think of coach, you can think of Bill Belichick, you can think of Coach Ciano, I think of Coach Gagliano. When you think of coach, it's a person, it's a process. I think it's a, a old railway car, isn't it? A railroad car? I know it's a purse. But in any case, we're going to use coaching from the purposes of a framework for starting a conversation. It also strengthens relationships by building mutually beneficial alliances. And I put Reed Hoffman in parentheses there because if you haven't read his book, Alliance, please do so. And I can't but, but think how applicable it is to think about the relationship between leader and employee, leader an individual in the organization, much like a coach these days on the athletic field. Tenure in most organizations now for employees is four, five, six years, sometimes three, sometimes less. Hey, sometimes you have an employee for fewer days than Coach Chiena as a football player. So maybe it is time to think about, we really have to work as an alliance. And he goes on to discuss, and this is Reed Hoffman, a lie that employers tell employees and employees tell employers. And that lie is this, and many of us were guilty of it. We bring a new employee on and we say, welcome to our family. Hmm. And, and you embrace the person like they really are part of the family. And the employee says, I'm so happy to be here as part of this new family. What's really operating behind the scenes is the employer saying, as long as you bring value, and as long as the, I get a return on investment, you'll be part of the family. And the employee is saying, well, as long as you provide a great work environment for me, I'll be here, but perhaps I won't. So let's not play that game. And it got me thinking, and he even mentions it. I know that when a new family member comes along, the Schaefer family, and we have five kids, I never thought to talk to Maureen about during tough times, we may have to develop a redundancy program for Andrew, because he eats the most or whatever it is. I never thought as a family, I would think about our children as saying, times are tough, we need to do some restructuring. And Andrew, I'm sorry to say, you're the one, but we'll give you a nice severance package. That doesn't happen. And on the flip side, so many of us are working for organizations now, and we've said we've been so happy to be part of this family. We're looking for roles as where they're working. So why not 
begin to think about this as Reed Hoffman says, an alliance. While you're working for me, I'll provide you with the conditions for you to be successful. And perhaps you'll learn new skills. In return, the company will benefit from what you bring and vice versa. So maybe we should be thinking about coaching like a real an alliance of the people you have working for us. Make the best of that relationship by building deeper, deeper, more meaningful relationships, which tend to keep high performers and develop newer levels of competencies. It facilitates women's leadership development. It is a process of identifying strengths, weaknesses, and blind spots. Yeah, we'll talk about blind spots again in a little while. It, it, you know, the, the, it gives us an opportunity to develop some type of effective um, development, which is more effective than mentoring, counseling, instruction. And it brings this whole sense of authenticity, perspective, and, jo and choice. But beyond that, we, I briefly touched on them. There's going to be many other changes. Look at technology advancing so quickly. I mean, it's mind blowing to see how quickly the world is changing around us and that the work itself is going to change. We all can't be subject matter experts in the areas we're leading. Technology is going to take over a lot of our roles. I don't know if technology will ever take over the area of empathy, uh, uh, the area of consoling an employee that's having a whole day. I think they're working on those things, but I think the, the part that we can play in this world that's changing so quickly is develop these coaching skills. Take a look at demographics, attitudes, and values in the workplace. I, I experienced it when I was in the workplace. I experienced it with the uh, clients I'm coaching now. Uh, there's a different view of what work is all about. There used to be a separation between work and home. And now that's being blurred based on being on time, being at work all the time but never really being there. This whole idea of working virtually, you're actually working all the time perhaps. So there's this blurring of when is workplace, when is work time, where is the whole person fit into this? My argument is that's a perfect place to start the coaching discussion. And I'm just watching the time. Okay, four coaching actions like I promised you. One, start by having a conversation with your people. And the next few minutes, I'll talk about how that conversation may look and feel. But please remember this picture that this is a, this is a deep, a deeper, a deeper come your employees in the past. I mean, look at the focus between those two communicators. I'm going to look at um, my granddaughter's beautiful view picture of her mermaid at the moment. And the conversation starts with questions. So the right questions deliver the answers. God rest Alex Trebek's soul. What a wonderful um, respite that has been for us, I know, at seven o'clock to bring some normalcy to our days. And But the, the point here is it's the questions that you begin to develop. They will deliver the answers, but you need time to think about what those questions look like and feel like. And the one thing I'm asked you to do now is when you begin to develop these questions, you're going to share with the people around you. You want them to be thoughtful and meaningful, but I want you to remove one word from the question. And that's why. When you begin questions with why and there's a lot of discussion around this in the coaching world there's some proponents saying you never ask a why question others say it depends on the situation but there's there's all different reasons why it would be wise to start to think about formulating them without the why question why often brings a um, sense of judgment why did you choose to go in this direction not that direction why do you think your uh, staff is not uh, reacting to you like you had hoped. It's defensive. It often begins to develop some form of um, questions around um, 
uh, right and wrong answers that may be um, delivered through a unsound thought process. When you ask why, you know, why didn't I get the promotion? Well, that's easy because my boss doesn't like me or my boss didn't want someone who has pictures of mermaids in front of him. That may not be the right answer at all, but we like to tell ourselves these stories. So take away why, why is past, why is judgmental and begin to think about how you can do what and how questions. I'll give you a few examples. As Margaret mentioned, um, I'm a student of the Columbia program and I think they made it a very complex process, very simple. Here's one guide, start with just fun, get some context around what the challenge is around the person you're coaching. And that's what's up, what's happening around them. Then you think about, okay, now I know what's up, get some what matters, that's the content. And then finally, begin to use questions to talk about and share, be their thought partner about what's next. Another way of thinking about it is, these are the competencies and targeted outcomes. It's helping others succeed. It's co-creating relationships. And more importantly, it's making meaning with others around this wacky world we live in. Another way of looking at it is the ORID model. Many of you are familiar with it. And it, it comes to us, um, it's, it's quite old and this one's been adopted from adapted from that. But this talks about starting with objective questions that are much like the what's up questions or what's happening of context questions about, let's just talk about the external focus and the facts of what we're working with right now. Reflective questions are the next questions that focus on emotions and feelings. And I have to share one story with you because this is where coaches get into, have the um, reputation of being soft and fuzzy. When I was in my, uh, the program at Columbia, uh, one of the participants that I went through the program was, with was a very senior level in a um, very well-known entertainment uh, company. And in the beginning of our sessions, he would say, I can't believe th th that this, this program doesn't understand that coaching has to be in the right context. And that as we have to get things done as leaders, we have to move things along. And by the end of the week, he looked at me and said, it was so nice as we practice our coaching skills to have someone ask me about how I felt. He said, I can't think of a leader I've ever had who looked at me and really cared about what was going on, how I felt. Yes, they may have asked me that, but I don't think they really cared. And I get, and I, I felt so good the whole week as we practice, when we would go back and forth between objective questions, reflective questions to check in, to see how you're doing, how you're feeling. What's about the whole person here? If we're trying to reach a certain goal, we better address all of it. There are, there are questions that are interpretative and that's based on the situation. What does this mean? What have we learned so far? And finally, uh, a mini framework for you is think about now decisional questions. We have these, we have, we've identified the whole, which direction are we gonna go in now? Okay, last part of the conversation is listen. I want you to, yes, remember the picture of this weird picture of the ear, but this is how I want you to think about listening. Remember these days, when you would listen to your child's or your grandchild's or your niece or nephew's first words, you hung on every sound moment. You couldn't help but to be completely engrossed in the conversation. Bill Downey and I talked about this yesterday. It's hard in this day and age to truly immerse yourself in a conversation these days. We're moving so quickly, technologies around this, iPads, telephones, um, text messages coming through, the boss is calling. This is really hard work. And it's hard work for reasons other than just distraction. It's reasons before we hear a lot of words every day, 125 per minute, 7,000 an hour, 30,000 a day. Boy, that gets tiresome. But also now that we have to look at the nonverbal cues that come across, 
it's difficult for me coaching virtually like this because it's so difficult for me to pick up many of the non-verbal cues that I would pick up or you would pick up in the people that you manage. Body language, facial expressions. Yes, this Ekman's facial expressions is a formal process of understanding what people are saying through their facial expressions only, no matter what they say to you. The tenor and tone of the voice changes the meaning of what's being said, and finally the words chosen. But I would suggest to you, as we wrap up the conversation on listening, this is the biggest challenge. We all listen, we're all good at internal, a level one internal listening. I'm hearing things, what does this mean to me? It's great, especially if you're in another country traveling for the first time, you have to listen very carefully to think about what does this mean for me and how do I get to point A to B or how do I stay safe in this environment? Listening at level one is a really good thing. However, it also involves your own opinions, views, and judgments. It's your internal chatter. To be a great coach, to lead like a coach, start to work on your level two focus listening. This is listening where, go back to that photo of the mother and daughter, you are completely listening. And the listening is all about the person speaking to you, not what you're hearing. I'll give you an example of level one, level two listening. I want you to go and tell someone or share a story with someone this week and say, yes, I just got back from, well, that'd be a lie because you can't go anywhere now. Yes, let's say I'm reminiscing about the time I was in Rome two years ago. Oftentimes when you tell someone you went to Rome two years ago, the first thing that comes out is, I've been to Rome too. Or yes, I don't like Rome. That's level one listening. Level two is you went to Rome, tell me more about it. Tell me more about it. Tell me more about it. So focus listening is not on, it's, it's, it's a deeper level of listening. This takes a lot of practice. You can't be distracted. I'm still learning how to do this much better, but you'll know when you're in that zone like an athlete. Okay, a bonus for you. As a part of this wonderful Lunch and Learn series, we're gonna give you some new fun information that you can use to amaze and astound those people at your Thanksgiving day table, whether it be virtual or face-to-face. -face. And it's on animal collectives. Everyone knows, I think everyone knows that that's a parrot. When a group of parrots are together, what's that called? Anybody so this know? is everyone, the time for that everyone should use their chat to uh, share the answers with us. Um, whatever your, your thoughts are on what you call um, a gathering of uh, parrots. I'd be so impressed if anybody got this answer. Our first guess is parade. Oh, close. One more guess. Let's see one more person's. And I want everyone else to get prepped because there's a couple more of these coming. Ooh, a gaggle. Oh, very good guesses. No. And by the way, the only reason I'm, I'm sharing this with you is I just found them to be hysterical. My sister sent them to me, has nothing to do with leading like a coach. It's a pandemonium of parrots. So, Again, you can astound and amaze Thanksgiving Day guests. The next area that I like to get back to is self-awareness. Self-awareness leads to self-management. You may see yourself as this soft, fuzzy kitten prancing through the beautiful day in the grass. And you're thinking to yourself, oh, so many people want to be around me. Just hug me, pick me up, show me to their friends. That's what you're thinking. And this is how your employees see you. So this is how you view yourself. This is how others see you. And what's astounding about this is how unaware we all are. I'll put myself in that criteria. This was a really interesting study um, that shows only 10 or 15% of us, and they're talking about leaders, are truly self-aware. And self-awareness starts with before you lead others, you better know who you are. But more importantly, you can lead like a coach by helping the people you lead find their new levels of self-awareness. Self-awareness is capturing blind spots. 
people just don't know they're not good at something. I'm a golfer. I remember being up on the range last year and I'm hitting these golf balls and I'm thinking, I bet your people are looking at me thinking, I'm just like Tiger Woods. They must be thinking, look at that flow, perfect swing. I can never figure out why the ball didn't go as far straight, whatever. That's not the point. I thought in my mind that a perfect swing until I took out the iPad and I recognized they have a slow motion view of your swing. Oh my God, that, that was a quick snap out of a blind spot for me. The good news about blind spots is coaches can help identify them, but also present them in a way to you that will help you change who you are. They're often called loving critics. My golf buddies are not loving critics. I found a loving critic an assistant coach, Joanna Henry here at Rutgers University, the assistant golf coach. And she didn't laugh at my swing. And she said I had a good foundation, but we started to build from there. But in any case, I was like this. I was so incompetent. I didn't know I was incompetent. And it robs me of my ability to realize it. So incompetence can lead to inflated levels of self-awareness. Self-awareness comes in Two styles, I'm not talking about interior decorating here. I'm talking about self-awareness has two components. And most people think of self-awareness in the latter. I would suggest to you that self-awareness starts with your internal self-awareness. Do I really know who I am, what I stand for? What, do I really know my aspirations? Do I really understand the values? When I have to have a forced, um, choice between what's important to me, where do I stand? External self-awareness is more around how other people's view you. So uh, my golf buddies see my real golf swing. I saw a different golf swing. So, but more importantly, the internal self-awareness is around, you start with know who you are, help your people that work for you understand who they are. And of course, nothing would be complete without a two by two. And this talks about people who are uh, either have low levels of internal self-awareness or external. I'll leave this to the recording for you to read more deeply. Another, this is a buddy of mine, Dr. Nick Melanera. We work on many levels together. And by the way, if you want to start with a controvers controversial thought, his work is around um, leading to um, developing high performance under high pressure situations. His normal clients are professional athletes, CEOs, Navy SEALs. And to get the ball rolling with a conversation with him, he would argue confidence doesn't lead to high performance. He said, confidence opens the door. Confidence is a belief. It's a feeling. It really doesn't develop performance. Performance comes through focus and practice. Uh, we work together uh, using a really cool instrument to identify self-awareness, it's called TAZE. We think it's different because it focuses on high pressure situations, but more importantly, it helps extract information around all the words at the bottom of that page to help people become more self-aware. Animal Collective 2, we're running out of time, so I'm not gonna even give you the opportunity to guess what jellyfish are, but it's a smack. Number three. We started the conversation. Number two, we're building self-awareness. Number three, we're building and sustaining a winning playing field. So why am I showing a picture of an engagement ring? That's to remind me to talk about employee engagement. Why am I showing a picture of a galloping horse? That reminds me to show this slide from Gallup Organization, which talks about if you want to engage your people around you, these are some of the questions you may ask. You may find some of these questions or forms of these in your own organization's um, um, engagement or satisfaction surveys. But powerful questions, I would like you to think about how the people around you might answer them if you were their boss. So the way you can coach like a leader, develop, a climate and atmosphere playing field that people ask answer in the affirmative here and positively. Number three, what in the world is that? If Sharon lines on, she does know what this is. That's a hedgehog. 
Jim Collins would be proud that I'm putting this in here. And when there's more than a few, they're called an array. And finally, before I end this, I want you to think about energy management. You know, when you, when you think about how it uh, coaching compares with the athletic field, there's a big difference. Uh, on the athletic field, we practice 99% of the time, 95% of the time, and perform maybe 1% of the time. As a leader, you are always on. You are always performing. And this area is around, we can't forget that we need to find the time to manage our energy. And if I took the book out, I will move the um, computer so I can't take a book out to show you. The Corporate Athlete Advantage is a great book. And it talks about, yeah, we're human beings, we're carbon-based, and we can't forget the fact that in the boardroom or in the athletic field, we need to manage our energy. And this is called a thing called rhythmic oscillation. We need to work and rest. We need to find time to re-energize. We need to find the time to just rest, to revitalize, to be a high performer. By the way, um, they have a very strong view on multitasking, which you've probably been reading about as well. And this starts at the bottom. Their argument is, if you don't take care of yourself physically and you don't energize, manage that energy, that will impact your emotional energy, mental energy, spiritual energy, and in fact, diminish your engagement and performance. And to end this, the last one is a wombat. And if there's a lot of wombats, you have a wisdom of wombats. So what we want to talk about here, if you want to lead like a coach, think about having a conversation, a deep conversation with people. You, you, you want to think about, you know, when it's conversation is ask the right questions and listen carefully. You want to help with your, in, your people's awareness of themselves, who they are inside, how they appear on the outside. You want to build that environment, playing field where they can perform the highest potential. If you're developing it, why not have an environment where that can be unleashed? And finally, be sure to give your people the time off. They need to rest. Be sure, like a coach, take someone, take someone out of the game. Take, tells them not to practice for a week because they're getting tired. Please be aware of that. And I think that's all I have for you. Thanks for letting me in your houses and offices today. Joe, what a fantastic presentation. That was uh, all the energy that I uh, come to expect from you. Great. Um, so we have a couple of comments and um, questions that have come in. And one of the first came early on in the, in the presentation, but I wanted to bring it up. Um, they used the term trained in capacity. Hmm. And I looked it up on my phone while, because I was not familiar with it. And it says, it's the idea that certain types of education, training, experience, and habit may lead an individual to be unable to think beyond a set of constraints and assumptions that they have formed. Um, and we saw that right over here, didn't we? Ah, oh, see, I didn't catch it. the words. My questions box covered up the words there. Yeah, that's exactly ah. what is what that captain had. All these years of experience, all this, you come to, yes, it's, it's you familiar. Go. You don't worry about the context. And you come up with prefabricated solutions. It, uh, the, just, the, the, the lighthouse should have moved out of the way. Just for our audience's benefit, I have all kinds of things as the... Uh, post going on beyond what you see on the screen and one thing was actually covering the words there so I, I never saw that oh that's great okay um so uh we have another person um and this may be something that has to be uh addressed separately but i'll tell you that we have people who are curious about the entrepreneurship that you've gotten into in terms of starting a consultancy and practice and um they're wondering how um if you have any pointers and how that is going Oh, how nice. That's a, I didn't expect a question like that. Um, it's, it's, it depends on how I, I, in the context of that. To answer the question, it's a joy. Um, one thing I um, try to um, successfully obtain with the people I coach is finding out 
what you're what you're good at and what you love to do. And I think finally, after 45 years, I really understand what I like to do and others are telling me I'm good at it. And so from an entrepreneurial point of view, I think it was um, doing what I love. Um, most of them, so I'm enjoying it. Uh, it's going very well in some ways, better than we ever imagined and taking up too much time, if that's the right word of our semi-retirement. Um, but it's a, it's a, it's, it's a joy and um, I'll be happy to speak to anyone offline, but we haven't done any type of um, digital marketing. Peter Methot would be appalled. I haven't done any digital marketing, haven't done any type of marketing whatsoever. It's been all word of mouth. And it's been um, uh, a real pleasure becoming our own entrepreneurs. Although when I say us, it's Maureen and Joe. Where's Maureen today? She is not making any contribution to F32. She's down there hanging out with this munchkin. <laughs> oh, I love it. Um, speaking of family, there's um, uh, one Andrew Schaefer who has a few words to say uh, about being picked on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. I'm, I'm just I'm just kidding about that. I'm from a big family too, so I'm, I'm I always think it's funny when when one person gets uh you know called out because we're so used to being treated as you know using your term as as a collective you know so, yep. um but that's funny. Um, the, a great question um came in about um the differences and a shift between coaching and mentoring, and just mm -hmm. wondering if you can talk a, a little bit about the the both subtle and great differences between those two and how you make a shift to playing one role or the other. Yeah, um, it's a question comes up all the time and people, it's a common error. And I guess the best way I can answer is in mentoring, um, the wisdom comes from the typically more experienced older person imparting wisdom on the receiving party. In coaching, the wisdom comes from the coachee, the person that you're coaching. So it comes from uh, two different sources. The wisdom's coming from and being unleashed from the coachee. In a mentoring situation, there's a different relationship and the mentor, the mentee is doing a lot of listening. The mentor is doing a lot of telling and the mentee's doing a lot of listening. In coaching, it's truly a co-facilitation. It's actually a partnership and the power comes from the coachee. So it's a much different um, source of where all the innovation, creativity, and potential lies. And it lies um, in the coachee, not the mentee, in my view. Uh, more asking than telling. Um, and one is, I think, um, the coach's role is focused on performance, high levels of performance. And I think a mentor is trying to disseminate knowledge and wisdom and experience. So that's a quick, quick answer. Okay, that's great. Um, and uh, another question that came in was about um, as as a coachee, um, you know, using um, that term, what can someone who's being coached do as something in return for their coaches? Um. I guess I'm, I'm hearing that question around how the coachee can make the coach's job easier, perhaps. And I think that's the context of this question. I'm not sure. But one is um, capturing the notion that this is a true partnership and that everything that's said is confidential and everything that's discussed is, is um, designed to benefit the coachee. Um, an example I can give is when we start to uncover blind spots and uncover weaknesses. Um, early on in the conversations, I hear people I'm coaching give me answers they would give in an interview question when they're trying to um, mitigate a weakness. You know, you tell me about one of your weaknesses. I work too hard. I'm a perfectionist. And if you really want to get a benefit from a coach, really answer honestly and truthfully so that with your coach, you begin to begin to um, unleash the potential that all of us have within to do some amazing things. It's just finding it, finding a way. Um, and that's just, um, it takes some time to build that trust to do that. 
All right, so we've got a couple of other questions. I'm gonna to try to squeeze in um, before we have to break away. Um, one is, uh, what do you recommend for someone who doesn't have uh, a mentor to rely on for advice? Mm. Um, that's a really good question because uh, I, I, an easy, uh, you know, a, a frequent mistake I've seen um, is people seeking mentors and often going to plan B and C in terms of their choices of who they would go to. And so I would suggest no mentor is better than a bad mentor. And a lot of bad mentors don't mean to be bad mentors, but there's a lot of, um, interesting discussions out there. Um, so that's a, that's a, I'll need to think about that one. I would suggest um, um, the, if I was coaching that person, we would be working around what is it that has precluded us from finding a great mentor and developing a plan to get one. Perfect. Um, even though we only have one more minute, there's one question that I want to squeeze in. And I apologize to everyone else who has thrown stuff in both the chat and Q&A um, that we weren't able to address every single thing. But Joe, we'll share those questions with you. And maybe we can come up with some way to put together a blog or something to address them. But here's the last one that I think is really, um, really, really important. How different should coaching be when it's done for a manager versus an individual contributor? Ah, oh, that's a really good question. I thought I was going someplace else. Shouldn't be any different. The only difference should be um, as a manager or leader, your role, your, the, the, your, your reason for being is to de de develop the potential in others. So as a leader, first, you need to understand yourself, understand your blind spots, your strengths, your weaknesses. After you've you know, discovered those, you can help those who you are managing. As an individual contributor, um, the focus would be on self more than others. Uh, it would be on self as it relates to how you interact with others. Even as an individual contributor, think about how lean and flat organizations are today. You know, this whole relationship is 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 gone in terms of, in many organizations um, in terms of title and role. It's about getting work done together. And so I would argue in many ways, it's the same other than you really can think about yourself as opposed to when you're coaching a manager, you're coaching to worry about others. All right, well, Joe, I wanna thank you so much for your time and for the fantastic presentation. As um, I expected and certainly tried to prepare our audience for, it was informative while at the same time being fun and interactive. Um, I want to thank our audience um, for enhancing the discussion. They were enthusiastic about participating in Q&A, chat, and our informal polls, which was fantastic. Um, friendly reminder to everyone that our RBS Virtual Lunch and Learn series takes place on Wednesdays at noon Eastern. We hope it's easy for you to remember in the middle of the week and the middle of the day. For more information, you can always visit our webpage, business.rutgers.edu slash alumni slash lifelong dash learning. I know that's long. So for everyone who's been uh, a registered participant, we will get that out to you via email. Uh, we have an exciting schedule of topics and presenters lined up over the next several months, thanks to great suggestions from our audience. So we encourage you to keep sharing your ideas with us. We want the series to continue to meet your needs. So please stay online for just a moment longer as today's webinar ends, because you'll immediately see a very brief three question survey about today's events. One of those questions will be a free form field that you can type in topics and or speakers you'd like to see featured in our future webinars. And finally, as I mentioned, when our webinar began earlier, a link to the archive recording will be shared via social media and emailed. It will also appear on the Business Insights page of our website. So everyone, I thank you so much. And my dear friend, Joe, thank you. Thank you. Um, enjoy the rest of your day and bye-bye for now. Thank you, everybody. Happy Thanksgiving. Stay safe. Bye-bye.